Um, so Dr. Sutterer, uh, welcome to the AOC PM&R podcast. Really glad you're here to talk to us. Uh, I'm just going to introduce you real quick, um, some stuff that I have collected about you. So you got your MD at the Indiana University School of Medicine, and you are a PM&R resident at the Mayo Clinic. And you're kind of well known for being the, the sports medicine guy on YouTube. You have a YouTube channel that you started about three years ago. And now it has about 230,000 followers. And I saw that about 10 months ago, it was just hitting that 100,000 followers mark. So it really looks like you've exploded. And I, I think that's awesome. And I know a lot of people are kind of thinking like this YouTube thing is, it's been around so long that it's kind of hard to get into the YouTube game. And so I was really fascinated when I saw that you started three years ago and that you've just seemed like you had this meteoric rise so far. Um, you have 22 million views of all of your videos combined and you profile a bunch of sports injuries and sports related content. Um, why don't I have you describe what, what exactly would you say you do? Who is your target audience for your YouTube channel and what are you trying to accomplish with your content? Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me on here. I think this is um, a really cool podcast and hopefully be able to reach some, you know, students that are interested in PM&R or even current PM&R residents um, to just talk a little bit about what I do and kind of my experiences. So thanks a lot. My, my target audience is definitely sort of the, just the average sports fan. Um, when I started doing these videos, I knew I didn't quite have the knowledge <laughs> to make this targeted to like a sports medicine physician. I don't want to go that in depth. Um, it's really just the average sports fan that, you know, is watching their team and sees somebody get hurt or reads about some story in the news and just kind of wonders what that means. You know, we hear about medical terminology with even things as simple as an ACL tear or an Achilles tear. And it's very easy to kind of just superficially understand what that means. But I think people enjoy learning about kind of more in-depth types of stuff. And so I'm just trying to teach a little bit while getting people interested in sports. And um, it's worked out pretty well. I've gotten pretty fortunate with the following I've had. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, it, it's funny. Most of the people I invite on to be guests here, I, I just know them because I'm looking for pm and people. But I actually stumbled across you because I'm a big UFC fan. And right after the Nate Diaz fight at UFC 244, um, mm -hmm. he, he had this really controversial cut and stoppage. And everyone was kind of scrambling, looking for like an expert opinion. And you had a video next day. And I've noticed that you do this with a lot of your, your videos, that you have this like really rapid turnaround time when someone is injured. It's almost like kind of reminded me of like the way that I've heard that South Park is created where it's like they have a week to get that week's news ready to yeah. go for for that weekend and it kind of seems like you're kind of like always on call that when something big happens you have this really rapid turnaround and I think that's like a big secret to your success is because people are interested in this stuff and they do want to hear it from an expert and so I kind of I can kind of see how that was like working out pretty well for you and I just think that's, yeah, that's a really cool niche you have. Yeah, the urgency of getting stuff up is definitely one of um, the things that I think has helped me grow. So the way I try to think about it, you know, if part of one of my goals down the road with this is to sort of be a, a sports medicine kind of media correspondent, if you will, to right. where if something happens, you know, it's on, you know, Sports Center that night. Hey, let's get Dr. Suter on the phone and just like ask really briefly, kind of like what's going on here. And so I try to, you know, build up enough kind of base of images and little kind of tips to talk about with these different injuries so that when something does happen, I can cover it pretty quickly, but then also have kind of a unique little spin to put on it each time. When I first started doing this, I thought, well, you know, if I talk about one ACL tear, that's going to be it. Nobody's going to want to hear about two, five, 10 ACL tears. But what I found is that people do still care, especially because it's, you know, their favorite athlete or whatever but I try to kind of do something a little bit different with each video. So I'll have the sort of same basic approach about the anatomy of the ACL, the mechanism of how it happens, but then I'll try to add one little kind of new nugget here and there with each video so that people who might've seen them before can maybe get a little bit more advanced in what they're learning about, you know, talking about the different bundles of the ACL and which bundle works at which different times. So I've been able to kind of cover the same thing multiple times. So I can kind of go into each video with sort of a base knowledge of what I want to talk about right. and then kind of add a little bit of additional info each time. But I think there, I think the best I've been able to do with that, I've turned around a video and I think about an hour and a half was the quickest that <laughs> I've gotten one done. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I think last year when um, Kevin Durant tore his Achilles, you know, going into that game, he had the calf injury. And so everybody was sort of, suspicious gosh is something going to happen and so i was sort of 
not really anticipating, but I imagine that, you know, maybe something would come up. And I think I had the video up just about by the end of the game. Um, and that's when people are going to YouTube to learn about this. They're going right in the moment when stuff happens. And so I know that if I'm a day late or even just 12 hours late, there's going to be a huge fall off in the amount of traffic. And so I try right. to be as quick as possible. Unfortunately, it does feel like I'm on call <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> um, which I've had to learn how to sort of balance and, and kind of, you know, not let that take priority with things because it is really easy. You know, there's stuff happening all the time. It's really sure. easy to get overwhelmed and thinking, you know, every little story has to be covered. So I've had to try to, you know, kind of pick and choose what I think is both interesting and something that'll do well in a video. Right. And given that we're currently in this pandemic where sports has been shut down across the globe, how has that changed the kind of content you can even look for something to talk about. I've seen that you have covered like moving back to sports and the UFC has opened again. Um, I saw a couple of your videos talking about that ring that the NBA players are supposed to wear that detects COVID. And I think that's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty smart. Has that been challenging or is there just so many topics that you could talk about that it's almost like you have a chance to actually get into these, these topics now? Yeah, I will say the break has actually been nice because there was definitely, you know, there's times where there's just so much happening where I feel almost too much like, pressure to get stuff done. And so the break has been nice to just kind of take a step back. I, you know, the kind of studio setup I have behind me here, I used to just record everything in front of a blank piece of paper hanging up in my basement. And so I've been able to take some time and sort of redesign my studio layout, which has been great. And you're right, there's tons of, of historical, um, you know, sports medicine stories that really the amount of learning opportunities is really endless. One of the things I'm working on right now is going through kind of a number of NBA players who have had their careers sort of ended prematurely from injuries and sort of taking a look back at what might have happened back then and what we might do differently today. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm definitely excited for sports to come back just because I think it's more fun and enjoyable to kind of see new stuff that I'm trying to kind of talk about and teach people on. But there's there's definitely plenty of, of kind of older content that um, that makes for great learning opportunities. So it's been good though. It's been a good little change of pace for a bit here. And I will say like at the medical student level, I still learn a lot from your videos. And even if it's not as in depth as maybe like a didactic, if we learned about ACL tears, um, it's, it's like really easy to digest. And even if it seems redundant that you're doing the same injuries for different sports and different people, I, I feel like that doesn't really harm you or your audience, because I imagine you have different subsections of audiences where someone is an NBA fan, but not an MMA fan. So if you sure. have like an ACL injury, it's covered by the NBA people. They haven't seen that video if it's being done by an, uh, sorry, I've kind of, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's yeah, the same different injury, people kind of different are sports, interested. Different teams. Yeah. Different people are watching different things. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it's also something it's been continuous learning for me. You know, I'm still finishing up my residency and so I still have a long way to go in terms of being able to really, you know, call myself an expert on all this. And so, a lot of times when I'm doing a video, especially some of these looking back, I'll sit and I'll do a bunch of research myself, you know, trying to see what kind of the latest review articles are out there for, you know, management of meniscus tears or the evidence for things like PRP or, you know, bone marrow aspirate stem cell injections. And so it's, it's actually been a ton of great learning just for me as well to be able to kind of have a, a, a starting point with a story that's interesting and then say, okay, what else can I learn? And so I think I've I've learned just as much kind of doing these videos as kind of my independent study for residency, which has been a lot of fun. And I imagine that kind of keeps you sharp too, because you are presenting this to a, a broad audience that you want to make sure everything's accurate. And, you know, they say that teaching is the best way to learn. And so this has got to be beneficial for you as well. I, I totally see that. Um, yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. It's, I try to always stay away from, you know, giving too specific of information, like specific frequencies or percentages or numbers because I know that you know I'm kind of making some generalizations about things and I don't want people to assume you know this is the the way I'll be all sort of uh, so to speak but it has been great it helps me talk to my patients better in clinic um, mm -hmm. when we're covering football games for example this past fall I had an athlete on the sideline who all of a sudden I was I was examining like a, a contusion he had on his leg and he kind of looked at me and he's like do you do you have a YouTube channel? And I was like, oh gosh. And I kind of was like embarrassed. And um, he's like, no, it's like really cool. I watch it. And I was trying to explain like why I was checking his pulse and what I was worried about with compartment syndrome. And his eyes kind of brightened up and he's like, oh yeah, like, I, like I remember a video. You talking about that and like yeah. someone else's video. And 
I felt like there was much more of a buy-in and like he actually just listened more attentively to what I was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's great. Like the number of times in clinic where an athlete has, you know, some devastating injury and they're really struggling with it. I like being able to point to a professional athlete that they're a fan of and say, look, you know, this happened to so-and-so. So, you know, you can relate to them. They were able to come back. They were able to fight through this and suddenly being able to make that connection with something that, the patients we see care so much about really helps them to sort of buy in to what you're talking about. And I think helps that relationship get even better. Yeah, totally. That makes perfect sense. Um, I wanted to ask you about like, why did you start this channel? Did you start this? Are, is, are you a PGY3, first of all, or I couldn't yeah, actually find so, that out by internet stalking you, but that's I was okay. assuming soon that's what be, you were. So soon to be PGY4. Yeah. Okay. And like, um, like what a week and a half, I think we, we transition. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so PGY3. And, you know, I started blogging in medical school, actually. When I was at Indiana University, they had a, a student blog that was like a day in the life um, of some of their students around the different campuses. And so I did that, I think, starting my MS3 year. And it was very just, you know, what's your rotation like? What are some experiences you're going through? And so when I came up here to, um, to Mayo, I knew I wanted to continue that in some capacity. It was a great way for me to express some feelings of what I was going through and also hopefully teach other people. Um, There was a resident who was an ophthalmology resident up here and actually went to Indiana University, Dr. Andrea Tooley, who's pretty popular on on social media and has quite a presence. And she had made a lot of videos on YouTube. And I thought, that's that's pretty cool. I like watching these. Maybe I'll do some of those. And so when I first got up here, I actually started off doing more kind of medical education, like day in the life of a resident, you know, what my ICU rotation was like, how to study for step three, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it was not until I did my first kind of sports video that things really kind of took off on my channel. And now I I miss doing some of the PM&R type videos because I still enjoy them. But I think now my audience is just a little bit too skewed to where nobody would, would find those as interesting. Yeah, and, and it makes sense to kind of cater to the people who you're most in demand from. Um, that makes right. perfect sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually saw one of your Kevin MD blog posts. I also blog on Kevin MD. Oh, I've right. had a couple things published there. And when I was looking you up, I saw that and I was like, oh, cool. Um, more people are doing this. So that was yeah. pretty neat. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so when you first started having success, uh, was it like people were just not watching for a while and then you had a breakthrough video or did you have a, a massive audience right away with, or how, how did that work? Has it been a slow and steady build like every week? Um, how did you like kind of accumulate your, your audience? I would say I had sort of, sort of two phases. The first phase of my channel before I was doing the sports content was definitely a very, very slow um, growth in my audience. And I think a lot of that was just because of who I was, trying to reach with the videos, you know, I was targeting medicine residents, I was targeting people interested in PM and R. And that's a very small subset of the subset of people that are even on YouTube within the medical community. And so I, I didn't expect that it would grow very quickly. I think the first year and a half that I was doing videos, I might have gotten a 1000 subscribers. And, you know, when I did the first sports video, I went from getting, you know, 500 people watching a video to like 50,000 watching a video. And so I went from like zero to a thousand in like a year and a half. And then I went from like a thousand to 200,000 in like a year. And so it was sort of this really, really slow period. And then all of a sudden this huge jump, and now it's kind of been just a steady trajectory. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard though, for people who start off on YouTube, it's definitely something that takes a lot of patience. I feel very lucky and and just like I kind of fell into the right kind of situation with something that people were interested in. But I've learned lately that you kind of have to step back and not really look at the numbers, not look at the view counts, not look at the subscribers, because that really isn't what it's about. And if you focus on that too much, just discourages you from actually doing something you enjoy. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people get too bogged down in that. And then kind of give up social media or give up whatever they were trying to grow because it doesn't, you know, reach these numerical levels that they envisioned. Right. Um, I mean, it sounds like it was definitely a passion project at the beginning, <clears throat> but do you consider it not like a chore now, but you said you're enjoying this break, but I imagine because you have had such a massive rise so recently, um, you got to strike while the iron's hot. And so does it feel more like this is your job now or is your day to day, PM&R resident duties, does that feel like your main gig? Or does this seem like this is your main gig? 
That's a that's a fantastic question. So I certainly do feel like my PM&R stuff is is priority number one. And you know, one of the nice things about PM&R is you're able to have hobbies. You're able to have a good life outside of medicine. Um, certainly, if I was in another specialty, I would never have the time to be able to do what I'm doing. And so I've I think I've I've been really good, and my wife has been great about you know, keeping me focused on residency is priority number one. And so if I, you know, have to be up early, if I need to study, that always has taken priority. But thankfully, PM&R allows you to have that good lifestyle balance to where I do have time to do it. But you're right, there definitely was a phase where things were really growing where, you know, I would have a hard time putting my phone down because I was always checking to see what was going on in the world of sports, thinking, you know, what if something happens? What if this is like my one opportunity to, to help grow my audience? And so it was, it was tough. There were definitely some stressful periods where I had to really kind of reflect on why am I doing this? What was the purpose of this? And sort of take a step back and realize, okay, this isn't priority number one. This isn't my job. This is a secondary thing I'm doing. It's okay to, to take a step back. Like everything will still be there. And that's been one nice lesson about what's going on right now is, you know, everything is still there. You know, it doesn't take away from what you've already done before and, um, but you do have to really learn to balance that. It, it is tough at times. You know, I think down the road, I could see it becoming more of a job, so to speak. Um, but certainly right now it's, you know, residency number one, fellowship number two. Um, and, you know, I realized too, I need to get that clinical experience to help kind of bolster all this other stuff along the way. Absolutely. How has this impacted um, how your, are your co-residents and your attendings, are they aware of what you do? And is there an extra pressure on you to like, are you, do they view you as representing the Mayo Clinic or something? Or are they, are you under extra scrutiny because you are trying to be a public figure? Because this is something that I worry about with um, my own blog posts or even doing this podcast. Is this something that, you know, I, I want to come off the best way I can. Do you feel that kind of pressure or are they completely supportive of you? Or are they like, I really wish you wouldn't do that, but you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Um, how they're hundred percent they supportive. Yeah, they're a hundred percent supportive. And, you know, certainly um, there's been a lot of things I've had to kind of learn along the way with that whole process. So, you know, I just a couple of weeks ago um, did an interview with somebody in the athletic talking about sort of the return of the NBA season. And the one thing kind of that Mayo's always told me along the way is this is great. We fully support what you're doing this. I even spoke at one of their social media residency conferences that they had last year, like entirely about my YouTube channel. So they've been very supportive of it. But the one thing is that I've sort of had to almost separate myself from the clinic in a way, because, you know, it has to be clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of the clinic. Right. And so, you know, I, I have to, you know, make sure I keep Mayo Clinic off of my, you know, YouTube header and, you know, try to make sure that people don't think that this is like the official opinion of Mayo Clinic, um, which I totally understand and I think is totally reasonable. But I think that's something a lot of students and residents, you know, need to think of whenever they're doing any sort of social media is making sure that you're not speaking officially kind of on behalf of your institution or on your school you know, you can still do these things. You can still share your opinion. You can still kind of talk about the things you want. But I do think you have to have open communication with your institution and with your school to make sure they know what you're doing, make sure, you know, they think it's professional. They can give you some advice along the way. But then also realize that you probably are going to have to, you know, separate yourself and be more of an individual in those efforts than truly affiliated with your institution. And so sometimes that is a bummer. You know, I I don't have Mayo Clinic on my Twitter profile anywhere. I don't have it on my YouTube profile anywhere just because now I want to start venturing into more kind of national media types of things. And I do have to make sure that it's clear that, you know, this is, this is Brian's opinion. This is not Mayo Clinic's opinion. This is not Mayo's stance. Um, so it's been a challenge at times to just learn how to sort of balance that. Mm -hmm. um, but they've been hundred percent supportive. Um, I think it's been great because it's helped interested residents in PM and R kind of find the specialty and it's always fun when people come interview and like, Hey, you know, I've seen your videos and stuff. So I think they like it. They've been super supportive and they give me a hard time for being like a, a YouTube <laughs> star, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been great. They've been really supportive of it. That's awesome. That's, that's really awesome to hear. Um, I'm just curious, having hit like a hundred thousand subscribers, did they send you one of those YouTube plaques? They did. Yeah. It's, um, I can grab it here off my shelf. Yeah. I, I'd love to <laughs> it's see one that. of those like humble brag things that people always have to find a way to, to sort of put in their background. 
So they sent it. Um, Look at that thing. It you was could... cool. I think I I hit a hundred thousand around like August of 2019, um, and then I think between the span of August 2019 and January 2020, I think I went from a hundred to two hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's like, well, what's the next step? And I've tried to stay away from like following all the counts too much. Right. You don't um, want to like undercut your success or yeah, exactly. You know, I, I feel like kind of what I've done is great and the numbers don't really mean much. Mm-hmm. I'd like to, you know, it's sort of a, a personal goal. I'd like to have around 500,000 by the time I finish fellowship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe within five or 10 years, like reach that million mark. And I think it's good to have something to be, you know, striving towards for a goal. Absolutely. Um, but if it didn't happen, if I didn't get a single another subscriber, it would still be a great experience and something I'd be super happy about. So that's awesome. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Did you have a background in video editing or is this something you just kind of picked up as you went along? I had to learn it all on my own. <laughs> um, my background's actually in engineering. So I, okay. before medical school, I was an engineer. Um, and so I've always kind of had that creative sort of, you know, liking to make things, build things, create things side of my personality. And I think that's one of the reasons I like the YouTube stuff so much is it allows me to, to create something, to, to use my hands, um, to make something, so to speak. Um, and I really just, I've learned by watching YouTube videos. So I learned YouTube by watching YouTube. There's so many great videos out there for how to edit, for how to film, for how to set up your lighting, equipment, all these different things that I just basically poured myself into that world, trying to kind of learn how to do these things. And I'll still try to, you know, with each video, do a little different of a technique or some little new animation or a little new editing trick to try to make it a little bit better. Um, always trying to, you know, make, work on my background, work on lighting, kind of work on all those little things to try to really make it the best possible product. Very cool. Um, shifting gears a little bit. I'm, I'm just curious, what was your journey like into PMNR? Was this something that you knew you wanted to do as a year one medical student or over time, did you get exposed to things? What other specialties were you considering and how did you end up going for PMNR ultimately? I started medical school 100% orthopedics. Um, like I said, I was an engineer beforehand. I did mechanical undergrad and then biomedical um, master's degree. And, you know, orth- orthopedics was the perfect fit. It was a way for me to work with my hands, you know, like carpentry in there and just very mechanical and very hands on. So I was dead set orthopedics or bust. Didn't want to be a doctor if I couldn't be an orthopedic surgeon. And then kind of through second year into third year, you know, I didn't do as well on step one um, as I really would have had to do to be an orthopedic surgeon Um, and was in a relationship and didn't really enjoy surgery. I hated the lifestyle that went with it. it was really a lot of what it came down to. You know, when you're actually in the OR, it was a blast. It was fun to operate. But then when I kind of stepped back and said, man, do I really want to spend 80 plus hours a week for the next five, seven years of my life doing this and everything else had kind of fallen into place that I really realized I didn't want to. Right. And so I was kind of lost. I really didn't know what else I was going to do. I thought, well, maybe family medicine, because then I could kind of do some sports stuff. And actually I Googled something to the effect of like best kept secrets in medicine or something like best kept secret medical specialties and PM and R popped up and I really hadn't even heard of it. To be honest, this was like the beginning of my third year. And I read about it some more. I was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. It's like non-operative orthopedics. You know, I can do sports. It's very mechanical, great lifestyle. And so then I just slowly got to know people at my university that were in the department, really enjoyed it, did some rotations and kind of never looked back. That's awesome. You know, I, uh, I relate a lot to your background. I'm probably leaning most heavily towards PM&R still, but sometimes I'm like, orthopedics is still what I want to do. And, and I really feel torn between these sometimes. Um, but, you know, one thing I have noticed about PM&R residents and people who are in the PM&R world is that they are some of the most creative, industrious, entrepreneurial type people. And I, I believe that they would not have that same sort of success if they were in a surgical subspecialty. And I know a lot of people are interested in surgery and find their way into PM&R. And I feel like if they would have chosen surgery, they'd, they'd be so inundated with like the 100 hour work weeks that they wouldn't be able to have time to do anything like creating a YouTube channel or, you know, mm-hmm. spending your time on other things. And, and especially when you balance like work life stuff, um, 
I have one daughter and my wife is super pregnant and she's going to go into labor oh, any day now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And and I think about that stuff like do I want to just fast forward 5 years and PM&R just seems like it's got the best of all worlds and I think that's what draws a lot of people to it that it's very procedural heavy. Um, and and I everyone knows that joke that it stands for plenty of money and relaxation and I feel like that yeah. is so unfair because the people I know in PM&R are like the hardest workers, the most creative people, and everyone's doing something. And I just think that that's really cool to see that, you know, in this specialty, you can pull off some of the things that, that you have done or our last episode with the gamer doc, Lindsay Miglior, another, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. PM&R resident. It's just cool to see what, what people do in this field. And so I appreciate you sharing uh, your journey with us. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about the Mayo Clinic specifically. Um, it's probably a loaded question to ask what are the the pros and cons no one would talk about the cons but what are the strengths of of this program and and what are the challenges of being a resident at the mayo clinic because i know it is a very prestigious place and i wonder is that extra pressure in what you do as a resident that everything's got to be super precise or is it just all been gravy so far um and what's your favorite thing about this program you know when i first did my away rotation up here i was very intimidated coming into work that first day. You know, everybody at Mayo wears suits to work. Nobody wears white coats. And so you're showing up for day one and you're walking in in a full suit. <laughs> and it's like, this is, you know, this is pretty intense. This is the Mayo Clinic and there's a lot of tradition. But the thing that stood out to me right away is just how down to earth and nice everybody is here. I mean, it's to the point where I had a patient once who said, he felt like he was in some like prank reality TV show. He's like, why is everybody here so nice to me? Like, this is ridiculous. Um, is that a Minnesota just, thing? Is that I think it's just like a Midwest thing. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of people who work here that are from the Midwest and grew up in Minnesota. A lot of people in the PM&R department are from Minnesota or from the Midwest. And everybody's just so humble and nice up here. I mean, you know, we have something in the hospital we just call like curbside. So if you don't need to really put in like a formal consult, we just have this system where you can call up another specialty just for a quick curbside question. And people love it. People are super nice. You know, you talk to all these consultants and they're like the world leading experts in some specific thing in gastroenterology. And they're super happy to talk to a pm and resident about, you know, whatever their question is for somebody on the rehab unit. Like there's just so much just friendship between all the different specialties up here that really I've never had like a bad experience with, you know, calling another specialty or having to talk to a surgeon and getting yelled at. Like everybody's just been super nice, which is awesome. You know, I think the strength specifically of our program up here is our musculoskeletal training. As you probably know, pm and is super broad. You know, even if you just look between the physical medicine side and the rehabilitation side, there really are almost like two totally separate kind of career paths you can go down if you do right. something like spinal cord injury and brain injury versus sports medicine and interventional pain. You know, the, the kind of fundamental theme of the specialty is the same, but really what you're doing day to day is extremely different. And so Mayo Clinic, I think our strength is really the musculoskeletal side. We have a lot of the, you know, sort of grandfathers of ultrasound, musculoskeletal ultrasound up here um, that have kind of been the ones who have passed down all that education to people who are now out at other programs sort of leading those musculoskeletal ultrasound programs. And so really, I think that's the biggest strength and that's why I wanted to come here. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do a sports fellowship from early on. And so having that really strong foundation in your musculoskeletal education and then also the ultrasound experience, the ultrasound injection experience, I mean, we get to do hundreds of ultrasound guided joint injections by the time we graduate. We do, I think I did like 250 EMG studies. Wow. Um, there's just tons of hands-on procedural time. And, you know, our rehab stuff is still really great too. It's definitely a different patient demographic. You know, we're not in a big major urban center. And so we don't see a lot of like gunshot trauma injuries. We don't see as many really bad traumatic brain injuries like you might see in a Chicago or a New York. But when we do see those patients, the learning we get is still, in my opinion, second to none. I mean, I've been super happy up here. Minnesota is great to live in, aside from the winters being pretty miserable and lasting for like, feels like 10 months <laughs> sometime. Mm -hmm. um, it's been great. Uh, we've, we've been really happy up here. That's awesome. Um, can you just walk us through what, what's a typical day look like for you 
and I'm sure it varies on, you know, the month and whatever you're doing at that time. But um, what, what would like a normal day start to finish just very roughly look like for you right now? Yeah. So if I'm in an outpatient clinic, so for example, right now I'm on my pain medicine rotation. So we do a lot of procedures, but you know, if we're on just a typical clinic day where we're doing consults, I'm usually, I'm getting into work by about 7.30 or so to kind of do some review of patients that are on the calendar for the day. I'll usually do some patient review kind of the day before when I have downtime also just to look ahead, kind of plan out, know who's coming in on the calendar. Um, and then between, you know, eight and four, we're seeing patients. One of the nice things about Mayo is we have longer time slots for all of our patients. And so a new patient consult is typically an hour long appointment and a return consult is 30 minutes. And so, you know, we might just have four patients in a half day. And so we really get to like do a lot with just those four patients. We're not running through, you know, a patient every 15 minutes, a patient every 30 minutes, just like go, go, go. We really have time to focus on the learning and the education because we're afforded to have that amount of time with each of our patients. When we're on the rehab unit, um, which is where I go in about a week and a half mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as a senior, which is going to be a whole new experience. Um, those days are typically more like seven to five. Uh, we come in, you know, we have two separate teams. We have a spine rehab service, and then we have a brain rehab service. And so there's residents that are on each team. And so, you know, you review the patients that you're taking care of on that team, do your pre-rounding, usually from, you know, about eight to nine 30, we sit and do our bedside rounds where we, you know, go over everybody with the full team. And then from, you know, 10 to 11, you're finishing your notes. And then throughout the rest of the day, you're taking new admissions, doing discharges, and then typically we're out of there by four thirty, five o'clock. And then, you know, you've got the whole rest of your day. So it's great. Yeah, that, that sounds awesome. Thanks for walking us through that. Um, I'm also curious about the current pandemic. How has this affected what you're doing as a resident? Are you, is it business as usual? You're doing the same kind of stuff. Are you doing like COVID rehabilitation? What, how has that looked over there? And and any preparation for the future in a second wave or it, what, what's that situation like for you right now? So the initial, when everything initially shut down, um, you know, PM&R is not, not really an essential um, type of specialty. Certainly the rehab unit is very essential. And so our rehab unit was, you know, going continuously, just kind of just as busy as ever. And now we are starting to get some COVID-19 rehab patients. There previously, there was some Medicare guidelines where you have to have a, kind of a, a certain percentage of your patients on the rehab unit have to meet one of, I think, 13 or so different diagnoses like, you know, spinal cord injuries, brain injuries, stroke. And they basically relaxed that guideline to where now you can take patients that are just debility from COVID-19. And so we are starting to see some of those patients come over under the rehab unit and likely that will kind of continue to pick up. On the outpatient side of things, stuff basically shut down for us like it did. I know at a lot of programs around the country, you know, we certainly did a lot of um, telemedicine type appointments. And so if somebody had, you know, like an acute active radiculopathy that was causing them severe pain, you know, we would try to do like a virtual visit, try to show them some therapy type exercises, get them in if it was truly like an urgent or emergent situation. But things were pretty slow. There was a lot of just, you know, studying on our own at home during all of it. So it's nice now for the past, you know, five, six weeks, we've been basically back 115% um, seeing all the people that we weren't able to see during the shutdown. But I think definitely we'll start seeing more kind of rehab COVID patients just with that general hospital debility coming through. But mm -hmm. hopefully it's not too many and we still are able to see our traditional, you know, rehab patients as well. Okay. Um, and out of all these things that you've described, what is like your favorite thing to do as a physiatrist? Is it seeing the patients? Is it doing the procedures? Um, what do you would get the most joy from? Good question. Probably doing the procedures. Um, I think I really like doing the ultrasound scanning, kind of the pre-scanning, doing the procedure itself. You know, I actually like even being in the rehab unit of all things. You know, it sounds crazy to say I'm going to do sports medicine, but I enjoy being on the rehab unit, I think it's it's fun. Like there's just a lot of, you know, you're with your friends, you're with your classmates, you're with this awesome team of people all day. And so while, you know, I don't really enjoy the, the inpatient medicine stuff as much as the sports medicine, I love being around the rehab team. And I think that's another one of just my favorite parts of the field is just how team focused it is. 
I mean, it's not just you rounding and seeing patients. It's you with your PTs, your OTs, your speech therapists, the rec therapists, the you know nurse coordinators, your equipment managers, the nursing staff, the PCAs, the nutritionists. I mean, like it's this huge team of people that are all getting together to work on taking care of these patients. And it's a fun group to be around. Like some of the best times in residency are when we're working the most hours on the rehab unit, just because you're around this great group of people and you're doing great things to help the patient. So I actually do like the, the inpatient stuff as well. Okay. Uh, and just to kind of close things out here, what, what does the future look like for you? Are you, um, are you vindicated that you want to do a fellowship and sports medicine seems like this logical choice, but you know, you've also indicated that you really like procedures and I know they have those sports and spine combined ones. What are you looking at in terms of fellowship and, and then also beyond like fellowship, uh, how, like the larger media presence, is that something kind of loosely still as a goal and then continuing YouTube, if it still makes sense, uh, what, what are your plans for like the next 10 years? We'll say. So I'm applying for sports fellowship. The applications actually just opened up a few weeks ago. And so we'll apply an interview in the fall of this year and then find out where we match um, in early 2020. I'd like to stick around um, here at Mayo. I think that'd be great. It's a great sports program, but there's a lot of really good ones um, around the country. So wherever I go, that'll be a year long process for just fellowship. And then, you know, it's hard to say, you know, I'd certainly like to keep doing the media side of things as much as possible. But I also know that I need to build up my clinical knowledge and really get that experience, you know, seeing and taking care of patients. And so I, I envision sort of early on having, you know, predominantly, uh, you know, four days of the week, at least that I'm kind of just doing my basic clinic stuff. Hopefully that involves a lot of diagnostic ultrasounds, a lot of ultrasound guided procedures. Um, but then I'd love to have, you know, a day or part of my week schedule where I can do the media stuff. Um, because I certainly, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, that is something that I'd love to sort of be one of the identities of, of my career and of my contribution is being able to, to do that education through that route. Um, but I know that it's kind of a gradual process. I need to get the clinical stuff, you know, kind of under my belt, really get that experience. And so hopefully things just kind of grow in parallel, um, to where once I get to the point where you know, I do have more of that experience. I can kind of get closer to calling myself somewhat more of an expert with all this, that, you know, the media stuff will kind of be at a level where I can just kind of take off more into doing that. And that's really a lot of what makes me super happy throughout the day when I'm following sports and and doing that. So I hope that continues to be a big part of whatever I end up doing. Yeah, I I did read in that, um, the athletic article, the part of it that I could read without paying through the paywall that you wanted to be the Sanjay Gupta of, of sports medicine. And I I feel like that's an awesome goal. And that's how I try to explain it to like my parents. Cause they're kind of like, well, why, like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, just think of what like Sanjay Gupta does, you know, something happens in the world with health or medicine, or even like Dr. Mike. Um, I've actually been fortunate to kind of talk with him a little bit with what he's doing on his social media platforms and, you know, even having a role like that, just being able to talk more about fitness and general health and getting people to exercise and be active, um, I think would be super cool too. Awesome. And last question, going towards the the fellowship that you're interested in, all the medical students are really in disarray about trying to figure out how to rotate at spots or PM&R or other things, and then even going to interview. And there's all this talk of virtual interviews. Has that disrupted your normal process going into your, your fourth year as a resident? Um, are, do you st- do you have like this network established where you, you've seen these people enough where it's okay to apply? Or are you similarly kind of like without a paddle, like a lot of med students find themselves right now, that if you haven't already exposed yourself to these rotations, you may not have a, a, ch- a chance to do that at this point. Is that kind of the situation you're in or is it, you're beyond that in a way? I feel very fortunate coming from Mayo because, you know, I think there are so many people who have trained here in sports medicine that have gone off to become program directors in other big sports fellowships across the country that, you know, I've been able to make some of those connections already. And so I definitely feel very blessed that I'm, applying in this time from a place like Mayo where kind of a lot of those connections and relationships already exist. It's definitely going to be tough for med students. I mean, I think at least in, in one sense, everybody's on a level playing field 
you know, even even the medical students that are from Mayo, if anybody applies for PM&R, they're going to still have to do virtual interviews. And so mm -hmm. I think they're really doing the best they can to keep it all nice and fair. And, you know, I think it's it's helpful for students to still try to get exposure the best they can. And so I think trying to make connections with people on different social media platforms, trying to reach out so that at least somebody knows your name. Now that's tough because you want to balance that. You know, you don't want to just be like overwhelming, bombarding these residents at all these programs. Like, hey, you know, let me do this. Hey, let me do that because that can also almost work against you right. um, and make people like you know just kind of calm down a little bit. But at least like trying to make some of those connections, introducing yourself. You know, if you see opportunities that pop up for any like virtual didactic sessions that are open, trying to to kind of do those things. You know, I know up here we're working on doing like a nice virtual tour video that I'm going to try to help with to, to still give some sense of kind of what it's like um, to be up here on campus. I think hopefully there will still be opportunities to meet the residents up here when people apply and interview. And on one hand, it'll be nice because there won't be as many cost prohibitive things for people to apply. And so I think you'll be able to apply more broadly. And so hopefully right. we'll get the opportunity to interview more people and to kind of get a wider net cast out for who we um, who we interview. And so for the student's perspective, that'll be nice. I mean, you don't have to worry about the cost of things. You can just sort of apply to, to as many places as you want. Um, but it'll definitely be a, it'll be a change. I mean, our interviews for fellowship are going to be virtual too, I think. Um, and so I'll kind of have to go through the same thing of saying, well, I hope I can get to know somebody just kind of talking through a, a zoom chat or whatever the case may be. And, you know, for my friends that are applying, to pain fellowships, they're also doing that right now. They're having virtual interviews already. And they've all said it's actually much better than they expected. They still feel like they are able to get to know the programs really well. They don't feel like it's really been that much different. And they've really liked how they don't have to pay a bunch of money to fly across the country to interview. So I think, it, I think it'll all turn out okay. I think everybody's just understandably a little bit nervous. Um, but I still think it'll turn out fine. I think people end up matching at the programs that they belong at um, and it'll all be okay. So hypothetically, a medical student who reaches out to you, invites you onto the podcast, a little over the top, is that too much? Is, or is that, that a good kind of <laughs> Not connection? over the top at all. Okay. Not over <laughs> the top at all. <laughs> awesome. So, so Dr. Suter, thank you so much for chatting with me. It's been awesome. And uh, I, I say awesome a lot, I'm trying to work on that. But it really has been awesome. I've learned a lot. And uh, I hope this has been a good experience for you. And looking forward to seeing what you do with your channel and everything else in the future. So thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, any med students watching, I, I try to do as best as I can at replying to Twitter messages and emails. Um, I'm sure my information will kind of be linked here with this, but, you know, reach out if there's something social media, YouTube, PM and R questions, whatever the case may be. I remember being in that situation myself, kind of trying to get involved, having questions, wondering what to do. So feel free, reach out, you know, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to hopefully answer questions and help people out through this. Is Twitter the best way for people to contact you then? Yeah, Twitter's good. Um, you can also, I don't know how you would share. So my email is just briansuter at gmail.com. Okay. Um, I have it on my YouTube channel, so it's not like it's secret or anything. Um, sometimes I just miss stuff. And so if I don't reply right away, just bug me. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'll get back to things, I promise. Okay, great. Hey, thank you again so much. This has been awesome. And we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Jake. Yep.